and welcome back to Ten with Zen. My name's Helen Woodward and I'm an advisor at Zen Educate. Today we're talking about women in science and tech and my guests are Dr. Lynn Bianchi and Charlie Pierce. So Lynn, you're the director of the Science and Engineering Education and Research Innovation Hub at the University of Manchester and also the director of the Great Science Share for Schools. And you had over 90,000 children participating last year, which is amazing. And Charlie, you're a software developer here at Zen Educate and previously a teacher of children with special educational needs and disabilities. So Charlie, I'm going to start with asking you, can you tell us about what interested and excited you at school and also how you now came to be working in tech in your role now? First of all, hi. Um, yeah, that's it's a long, it's a bit of a long, complicated story, really. Um, at school, I liked um, technology type stuff. I liked. I, I'm not big on maths personally. I find sort of logic and maths quite hard. Yeah, I wasn't really encouraged too much in school to kind of go down the science route at all. Really, my sort of journey to like from college and sort of to university yeah it was all sort of music tech related I was very very lucky to have the support of my parents in that in that way because they never went to uni or anything but um they they just wanted me to enjoy what I did and I think having that support is really really important I started I did a bit of work in tv and editing and stuff but I didn't really like the culture it felt very cutthroat and should have been, felt more collaborative than it actually was so I kind of left that for a bit and then started working with kids started working with kids with autism um supporting them um which led to me being a ta which then led me to be go do my teacher training but i love sort of technology and you know working with uh, computers and things and i just thought i needed a change so turned my hand at the grand old age of 35 to software engineering wow. and here I am. <laughs> so it sounds like a lot of your music tech work was self-taught. Oh yeah 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 right. it's just exploration discovery and just just following that sort of path of like your kind of highest excitement and your highest inspiration. Um, um, so thank you Charlie I'm going to take us now to Lynn because I know I know one of your mantras is that science and engineering is for everyone. Um, so can you tell us some of the data around career choices and at what age children start selecting out of some of those opportunities? Sure. Thanks ever so much, Helen, and to Zen to invite me onto this podcast. It's very exciting. It's a great time of year for us to be having this conversation as well um, as we're running up to the Great Science Share for schools this June. But you're quite right to focus in on um, you know the career choices that children make, and um, I suppose we wouldn't expect young children to be making choices uh, about careers because you know it's a long time off, isn't it, if you're in a primary school. But actually, the evidence from um, King's College, there's a piece of work that's been done by uh, Pro uh, Professor Louise Archer, um, and it's all around science capital. And, and this has been out for a few years now. And it was it was interesting to read that actually children nowadays um, are making those choices about whether to stay in STEM or not to have an identity with STEM. That's really the way to say it. You know, they, they affiliate with STEM or they don't affiliate with STEM. And those choices can start as young as eight so that you know, so in the past there's been a lot as um, uh, as we know around you know outreach activity and careers type work happening in secondary school, but actually that's too late. You know, I think because our culture actually Charlie has changed and and our young children have got older much sooner, um, and they're quite wise little characters nowadays. Um, just having three daughters myself, I know how quickly they grow up it's just through those junior years. Um, and yeah, that's when we've got to catch them. That's when we've got to catch their interests. An experience of a high quality experience for science and engineering in the primary years is essential, not because we just want to churn lots of scientists and engineers out or more children into you know, making a choice later on to take a degree in STEM, but to have a choice to say science is for me or actually I've tried it, but I feel more aligned to something else. But if you don't get that rich opportunity, you don't, you're not going to manage to make that informed choice. That's really interesting. And, and, and as young as eight, it's, it's, 
almost shocking, isn't it, actually? Because you realise that unless you really open up those inclusive opportunities very early on and give those messages really, really early on, um, children and young people can, without knowing it, actually kind of, as you say, not identify with science and engineering subjects. Even as educators and, and you know, sort of people who work in schools, we're really battling against a society that is that has so much sort of coding towards it that like these are girls things and these are boys things like if you're raised and um, socialized as female then you at all male you you get these messages so hard from such a young age and I agree that like by the time you're a teenager it's almost too late like these things have been happening since since these kids are babies so we've got to really really push back against this bigger <laughs> bigger force if you will and um yeah sort of show the kids that actually it is for everybody it's not just about the children i think more so nowadays it's also about the family as a whole because okay. those conversations are happening every day around the around the breakfast table if we have one anymore but you know but they your parents are such a massive influence to the way that you think uh, can i be this can i be that what do you think and if if the mm. if the family um haven't got a rich science capital and knowledge of, of science and what the diversity of careers that are out there now, which are just so different to when we grew up. So I think family, school and child are a really powerful. Well, that is the mix, isn't it? That's what we've got to get right. Charlie, so I, I want to ask you, what, what would your message be to young people who are interested in a career in tech, but just not confident in their abilities? I really think that sort of representation is really, really important. So if you, if you can and you find someone who you feel sort of reflects or looks like you or seems like you in that field and like follow them on social media and find out about their journey and like you know reach out and sort of find a sort of community that can help and support like i sort of said like if you're sort of socialized female or like socialized male um you've got sort of different things to work against so being aware that there are that there's this code <laughs> um, is really really helpful because if you think well people say that this thing isn't for me but I like it so it is for me um, having that sort of little mantra and belief I think really really helps okay so that sounds like you know if you can seek out a role model and a mentor and, sure. and, and get in touch with them okay mm. and, and again I'm wondering if that's something that that um, schools need to be perhaps more aware of or more active in kind of creating those possibilities for links and mentors some children have them naturally through their families don't they and actually some children just don't that's right i think i think you're right um it was interesting a piece of work that we did um a few years back now with some manchester and stockport schools and, and they created a project called science for families and one of the first things they did was audit the playground so it wasn't even about reaching out that far into oh you know where are in our industry links and how we're going to make contact with this engineering company or that science and tech company but it was actually saying who's bringing our children to school today you know and when they audited the playground what was what what was the um uh, job that mum and dad were in what was auntie in what was grandma and granddad who just retired from and when you saw the breadth um, of stem careers whether they acknowledged it or not and some children didn't acknowledge for instance hairdressers to be a scientist but the amount of science that they use in their life and then tracking that and actually exposing look at our, our school community we have these people and so let's bring them in and let's let's um, support them to to build that culture around our school that's that's really lovely actually and how exciting that that, that, that was literally already in the community it was all sorts and, and you know i i encourage you know teachers to do that you know just audit your, te audit your parents audit your families who's out there that's lovely and then you're kind of leading us on to my last question which was what can school leaders be doing to promote science and engineering for everyone and and i think it would be good because of the research you've referred to at the start and um, particularly for children under eight because that's such a crucial time so what can school leaders be doing with the under eights um, to promote science and engineering for everyone 
So I think school leaders do have a really big responsibility towards their teaching staff to, to build the confidence of their teaching staff. Our primary schools are full of amazing teachers, but they've not all got a science background. They've not, you know, they've not all got a, um, a, a strong level of confidence in their in their own capabilities within science and engineering. And I think some more time given to professional development around that really will help it's something that's gone off the radar in the past few years due to the pressures of literacy and numeracy and safeguarding so let's just bring that culture back that that every teacher is entitled to some stem cpd um in the next year let's try that one school development plans are great places to put an objective because then that will drive change as well and that will also mean that we do it together that no teachers having to carry this by themselves science subjects leaders are great to have but you know having a whole school culture and really putting science on the map for a year or two will really just bolster and invigorate opportunities um, there are lots of us out here in the STEM education community. So oh, let's open our eyes and our schools to who is out there that can support. There's so many free resources. But I think the, right, the real bottom line is to make your school an inquiring school, a school where questions are asked, questions are listened to and questions are valued. Now, I haven't said questions are always answered because that's not always possible. But valuing children's questions, giving them the choice and decisions, it'll come back to what Charlie said. She had interests and curiosities and perhaps they weren't embraced and listened to enough at her in those formative years. But by being able to um, give children that chance to have some control and decision making over some aspects of their learning would possibly give that strength. To, uh, to science really thriving back in our primary school. Um, but science in context, really understand why we teach science in primary. It's not just to cover the national curriculum, it's to make sense of our world. And they're gonna do that through questioning. Thank you, Lynn. That's, that's been wonderful to listen to, actually. And your passion and your excitement comes through every time I hear you talk, which is, which is really lovely. Um, Lynn, I'm just going to ask you to really quickly tell us, how can schools join the Great Science Share this year? Oh, I'm so pleased that you've asked me that. Yeah, um, so the Great Science Share for Schools is an annual campaign. It's a UK-wide campaign, but actually it's even gone beyond the shores of the UK now, which is amazing. Um, it kicks off on the uh, week of the 3rd of May um, with a series uh, of six weeks of resources, um, and then we culminate on the 15th of June. And lots of people are saying at the moment, how do I get involved? Well, the first thing to do is register. Register on the Great Science Share um, website, www.greatscienceshare.org. Then you'll get lots of information. But the key to it all is no, don't, don't try and buy off too much. Do what's feasible. It's just about doing a bit more science in this time between May and June and celebrating it with us all on the 15th of June. We've got lots of live lessons and resources um, that are there direct into the classroom. I can't tell you how exciting it is. All free. And there are hundreds of thousands of children involved this year, which is just amazing. Thank you so much for being our guests today, Lynn and Charlie. It's been great talking with you both. So thank you. Thanks. Um, for our listeners, we always follow up our podcasts uh, with a blog post, summarising the main themes and with key links to help you find out more. Um, so I'll say thank you once more to our guests. Thank you again to our listeners for joining us on 10 with Zen and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for listening to 10 with Zen. If you'd like to book staff for your school in London, Birmingham or Manchester, do visit zeneducate.com to find out more. Mention 10 with Zen to our team for 50% off the first two days of your short-term booking or long-term role.